Good day, my beloved brothers and sisters in Christ. Brazil was hit by an awful earthquake. Then there was a strange sound. What occurred? Is that the wrath of God or a sign of the end times? In this episode, I will explain in more detail. Smash the thumbs up button for me, leave me a comment down below, and share this. Let's get started. When an earthquake occurs, strong shaking makes everything vibrate and shake. Buildings shook, streets seemed to be caught in a giant wave, and a feeling of insecurity spread everywhere. The larger the earthquake, the more severe the consequences, and in Brazil, it has caused immeasurable damage. In large cities such as Sao Paulo or Rio de Janeiro, high-rise buildings and sturdy infrastructure have suffered heavy destruction. Powerful buildings were destroyed or suffered heavy losses, causing thousands of people to lose their homes and shelters. However, the destruction is not limited to urban areas. In rural lands and jungles, wooden houses and small communities also endured staggering consequences from the earthquake. These people often lived close to nature and did not have strong infrastructure to withstand natural forces. Besides urban areas, rural areas also did not escape the devastation of the earthquake. Wooden houses and farms were heavily destroyed, creating heartbreaking images of loss and despair. The small winding roads among the lush green forests are now silent and deserted, leaving only traces of destruction with fallen tree branches and piles of rubble. The local people walk the streets as if walking slowly in pain and loss. They are trying to pick up the pieces of their lives but are still filled with anxiety and uncertainty about the future. Some people looked at the ruined buildings with empty eyes, but their hearts were still full of hope for a brighter tomorrow. The consequences of the earthquake in Brazil devastated not only infrastructure and property but also severely affected community and the economy. Loss of home, personal property, and colleagues causes insecurity and instability in the daily lives of millions of people. Local industries suffered losses that were not immediately recoverable, reducing income and employment for the community. Despite great challenges, solidarity and cooperation both within and beyond the community can create hope and strength to help in the reconstruction and recovery process. Please join us in praying for Brazil in these difficult times. We pray for Brazil where millions of people are facing endless challenges and difficulties after the devastating earthquake. May God give them the strength to overcome these hardships, suffering comfort in times of suffering, and hope for a brighter future. May God bring hope and light in the darkness and preserve and protect Brazil and its people in His love and grace. Amen. After the earthquake, an eerie silence descended for a moment, thick enough to clog one's ears. Then, from somewhere in the distance, a sound pierced the quiet. It wasn't the usual rumbling. After this was a long sustained BL like a mournful trumpet call echoing through the canyons. The sound sent shivers down spines and caused even the most rational minds to wonder. Among the shaken residents, whispers and theories began to spread like wildfire. Some, clinging to a sense of normality, offered earthly explanations. Perhaps it was a freak weather phenomenon, a strong gust of wind funneling through a crack in the earth. Others, more superstitious, pointed to the timing. The unearthly trumpet following the violent quake. They spoke of biblical prophecies and signs of the apocalypse, their voices laced with fear in a strange kind of anticipation. The sound, both mesmerizing and unsettling, hung in the air long after its source faded, leaving the town grappling with the unsettling reality of the earthquake and the unsettling mystery of the trumpet's call. As the tremors of the earthquake gradually subsided, leaving behind a tense calm, another unexpected occurrence unfolded from seemingly out of nowhere. A vast swarm of flies descended upon the once serene and beautiful Mexico City. These flies, measuring about 8 m in length, possessed a striking appearance with a dark gray hue adorned by shimmering flecks of gold adorning their backs. Some speculated that they belonged to the species known as cluster flies, characterized by their tendency to gather in large groups. Have a look. Oh, plenty of flies. Don't look too bad at the moment. 
but you can actually see the side of the chimney. Can you pick that up? The sudden arrival of these insects puzzled and intrigued the residents of Mexico City. They observed as the flies settled upon every available surface, from buildings to trees to street signs, seemingly indifferent to the chaos and destruction wrought by the earthquake. Despite their overwhelming numbers, the flies appeared harmless, exhibiting no aggressive behavior towards humans or animals. Yet their presence added another layer of surrealism to the already surreal aftermath of the earthquake. Against the backdrop of crumbling infrastructure and displaced communities, the sight of these ethereal insects lent an eerie sense of otherworldliness to the scene. Scientists and entomologists scrambled to understand the origins and behavior of these mysterious flies. Some speculated that they were drawn to the city by changes in atmospheric conditions or disruptions in their natural habitats caused by the earthquake. Others theorized that they may have been inadvertently transported to the city by strong winds or atmospheric currents. The strange appearance of these flies was also mentioned in the UK. In the UK, there are many cluster flies. They seem harmless. But don't you think this is strange? After the earthquake, strange flies suddenly appeared. If you pay a little attention, you will see that this is similar to a Bible verse. If you will not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies on you and your servants, on your people, and into your houses. The houses of the Egyptians shall be full of swarms of flies, and also the ground on which they stand. And in that day I will set apart the land of Goshen, in which my people dwell, that no swarms of flies shall be there, in order that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the land. The next plague continues the theme of swarming insects. After the Pharaoh refused again to let God's people go, God sent a plague of flies throughout Egypt. The whole of Egypt was overrun by these pesky winged insects, except for the land of Goshen, as this is where the Israelites lived. Is this prophecy being fulfilled? The uncanny resemblance between the biblical passage from Exodus and the sudden appearance of swarms of flies in Mexico City and beyond inevitably sparked discussions about the potential fulfillment of prophecy. Many individuals, both religious and secular, found themselves pondering the parallels between the events described in the Bible and the contemporary phenomenon unfolding before their eyes. In Exodus 8 verses 21-22, God warns the Pharaoh of Egypt that if he does not release the Israelites from bondage, he will send swarms of flies upon the land, sparing only the land of Goshen where the Israelites dwell. The subsequent plague of flies, which afflicted Egypt but spared the land of Goshen, served as a demonstration of God's power and a testament to his protection over his chosen people. As people contemplated the eerie similarities between this biblical narrative and the events occurring in Mexico City and other parts of the world, questions arose about the significance of these parallels. Was this merely a coincidence, or was it possible that history was repeating itself in a remarkable and unexpected way? Some saw the arrival of the flies as a potential sign or omen, a manifestation of divine intervention or judgment in response to the moral and spiritual state of the world. Others approached the phenomenon from a more skeptical perspective, attributing it to natural or scientific explanations rather than supernatural causes. Regardless of one's interpretation, the convergence of biblical prophecy and contemporary events served as a powerful reminder of the enduring relevance of ancient texts and their capacity to inspire contemplation and reflection in the modern world. Whether viewed through a religious lens or a secular one, the parallels between the biblical plague of flies and the modern-day swarms prompted people to grapple with timeless questions about faith, fate, and the mysteries of the universe. As speculation swirled about the potential fulfillment of prophecy, individuals and communities grappled with the profound implications of the events unfolding before them. Some saw the arrival of the swarms of flies as a sobering reminder of humanity's interconnectedness with the natural world and the consequences of our actions on the environment. They viewed it as a wake-up call to address pressing issues such as climate change, deforestation, and pollution, which threaten the delicate balance of ecosystems worldwide. Others approached the phenomenon with a sense of awe and reverence, interpreting it as a divine message or warning.
For believers, the parallels between the biblical narrative and the contemporary events raised profound questions about faith, destiny, and the mysteries of the divine. Some saw the arrival of the flies as a call to repentance and spiritual renewal, urging people to heed the lessons of history and align themselves with higher principles of justice, compassion, and righteousness. Yet amidst the speculation and interpretation, there were also those who approached the phenomenon with a sense of scientific inquiry and curiosity. Researchers and scientists sought to understand the ecological and environmental factors driving the sudden appearance of the flies, conducting studies and experiments to unravel the mysteries of their behavior and migration patterns. As the discussion unfolded, the story of the flies became a focal point for dialogue and reflection, sparking conversations about the intersection of religion, science, and the natural world. People from all walks of life found themselves drawn into the debate, grappling with questions about the nature of existence, the limits of human understanding, and the interconnectedness of all living beings. In the end, whether viewed through a religious, scientific, or philosophical lens, the story of the flies served as a potent reminder of the complexity and beauty of the world we inhabit. It prompted people to confront fundamental questions about the nature of reality and our place within it, challenging us to approach life with humility, curiosity, and a sense of wonder. And as the mystery of the flies continued to unfold, it left an indelible mark on the hearts and minds of all who witnessed it, inspiring contemplation, exploration, and a renewed appreciation for the inspiring diversity of the natural world. The earthquake was God's wrath. Wrath is defined as the emotional response to perceived wrong and injustice, often translated as anger, indignation, vexation, or irritation. Both humans and God express wrath, but there is a vast difference between the wrath of God and the wrath of man. God's wrath is holy and always justified, man's is never holy and rarely justified. In the Old Testament, the wrath of God is a divine response to human sin and disobedience. Idolatry was most often the occasion for divine wrath. Psalm 78 verses 56 to 66 describes Israel's idolatry. The wrath of God is consistently directed towards those who do not follow His will. Deuteronomy 1 verses 26 to 46, Joshua 7 verse 1, Psalm 2 verses 1 to 6. The Old Testament prophets often wrote of a day in the future, the day of wrath. Zephaniah 1 verses 1 to 4, 5. God's wrath against sin and disobedience is perfectly justified because His plan for mankind is holy and perfect, just as God Himself is holy and perfect. God provided a way to gain divine favor, repentance, which turns God's wrath away from the sinner. To reject that perfect plan is to reject God's love, mercy, grace, and favor and incur His righteous wrath. The New Testament also supports the concept of God as a God of wrath who judges sin. The story of the rich man and Lazarus speaks of the judgment of God and serious consequences for the unrepentant sinner. Luke 16 verses 9 to 31. John 3 verse 36 says, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. The one who believes in the Son will not suffer God's wrath for his sin because the Son took God's wrath upon himself when he died in our place on the cross. Romans 5 verses 6 to 11. Those who do not believe in the Son, who do not receive him as Savior, will be judged on the day of wrath. Romans 2 verses 5 to 6. Conversely, human wrath is warned against in Romans 12 verse 19, Ephesians 4 verse 26, and Colossians 3 verses 8 to 10. God alone is able to avenge because his vengeance is perfect and holy, whereas man's wrath is sinful, opening him up to demonic influence. For the Christian, anger and wrath are inconsistent with our new nature, which is the nature of Christ himself. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17. To realize freedom from the domination of wrath, the believer needs the Holy Spirit to sanctify and cleanse his heart of feelings of wrath and anger. Romans 8 shows victory over sin in the life of one who is living in the Spirit. Romans 8 verses 5 to 8. 
Philippians 4 verses 4 to 7 tells us that the mind controlled by the Spirit is filled with peace. The wrath of God is a fearsome and terrifying thing. Only those who have been covered by the blood of Christ shed for us on the cross can be assured that God's wrath will never fall on them. Since we have now been justified by His blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through Him? Romans 5 verse 9 The Holy Land is a region where earthquakes occur frequently. By one means or another, Big earthquakes have been documented in the Holy Land for a period exceeding 4,000 years. Many are known from history, literature, especially the Bible. Holy Land earthquakes are also evidenced from archaeological excavations. No other region of the earth has such a long and well-documented chronology of big earthquakes. Recently, Geologists have investigated the 4,000-year chronology of earthquake disturbances within the uppermost 19 feet of laminated sediment of the Dead Sea. Two hypersaline waters preserve seasonally laminated sediment because organisms cannot live or burrow in the bed of the lake. As a result, only a nearby earthquake or very large distant earthquake can homogenize the lake's uppermost sediment layers, producing a mixed layer devoid of laminations. A sketch of a sediment core from the west side of the Dead Sea appears in Figure 1. The sketch shows the depth of the mixed layers within the laminated sediment sequence. Two deeper mixed layers in the Dead Sea are datable from historical, archaeological, and geological associations with faulting, the earthquakes of 31 BC, the Qumran earthquake, and 750 BC, Amos's earthquake. Other earthquakes are represented in the Dead Sea sediment core with dates approximated by assuming a steady rate of sedimentation. Consider 17 of the most important earthquakes that relate to the Bible. The earthquakes are listed in chronological order. We begin with creation and go through to the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Day 3 of Creation Week On the third day of the Creation Week, the waters of the earth were collected into the oceanic basins as continents appeared. Before day three, the waters had been over the whole earth, continents seemed to have been uplifted, and the ocean floor was depressed during a great faulting process that established the foundations of the earth. We are told that angels saw and praised the omnipotent God as the earth-shaking process occurred. Today, the earth's continental crust has an average elevation of 2,000 feet above sea level, whereas the oceanic crust has an average elevation of 13,000 feet below sea level. Can anyone properly comprehend the colossal upheaval that formed continental crust on day three? Angels must have watched in awe. Noah's Flood The year-long global flood in the days of Noah was the greatest sedimentary and tectonic event in the history of our planet since creation. See Genesis 6-9. One of the primary physical causes of this great judgment was the fountains of the great deep, all of which were broken up on a single day. The verb for broken up, Hebrew, means to split or cleave and indicates the faulting process. The enormous upheaval, probably associated with faulting of seafloor springs, unleashed a year-long global flood. God's purpose was to begin the human race again from the family of Noah. Destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah a disaster called an overthrow was delivered in about 2050 BC on the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. That event was so spectacular, swift, and complete that it became proverbial for the severity of judgment that God's righteous anger could deliver. Jesus spoke woes exceeding those spoken against Sodom and Gomorrah on Galilean cities that rejected his teaching. The swiftness of Sodom's judgment was used by Jesus to illustrate how sudden his return will be. Of the five cities of the plain, only Zor is described as surviving the catastrophe. Zor is the site to which Lot and his family fled with the approval of the angels. As a city, it flourished through the time of Moses and the kings of Israel, even being described as a city of the region of Moab by the prophets. Arab historians in the Middle Ages refer to Zor and identify the city as modern Safi, southeast of the Dead Sea in Jordan. Because Lot and his family made the journey by foot in just a few hours, Sodom must be less than about 20 miles from Zor. Two early Bronze Age archaeological sites southeast of the Dead Sea, Babethdra and Nemera, 
reveal evidence of catastrophic collapse and burning along the eastern border fault of the Dead Sea Transform Fault. These two sites are likely the remains of Sodom and Gomorrah. After God's voice shakes the earth mightily, Haggai 2 verses 6 and 7, 21 to 22, Hebrews 12 verse 26, and fully accomplishes these extraordinary geologic changes, his saints will receive a kingdom which cannot be moved. Thank you for watching, and stay tuned for the next video.